We're going on assignment with the Voice of America. How has it been like covering this? And I have a list right here in front of me of all the journalists who are beaten. I make the call because I'm on the ground. The Chechen. Gabe Joslo, VOA News, Mogadishu. Welcome everyone to another edition of On Assignment, coming to you from VOA Studio 55. I'm Alex Villarreal. And I'm Imran Siddiqui. We start this week in Egypt, where bitter political divisions are still raising international concern. The U.S. presidential election may be two years away, but our national correspondent is already following potential candidates. Then here in the Washington area, why a French rail company's role in the Holocaust is affecting plans for a new subway line. And can weight loss surgery cure type 2 diabetes? Our health reporter answers that question. Your inside look at VOA reporting around the world on assignment starts right now. Death sentences for more than 500 people in one verdict. It sounds too extreme to be true, but it happened in Egypt. And it's a decision being condemned by legal and rights groups around the world. The accused are Muslim Brotherhood supporters convicted of killing a policeman last August, along with other violence. VOA Cairo correspondent Elizabeth Arad says the case reflects Egypt's deep divisions. Right, and Imran, I talked to Elizabeth about this verdict, and uh, here's a clip from our conversation. Elizabeth, really big story that we've seen recently coming out of Egypt, this sentencing of 529 people to death. What's been the response among Egyptians to this and to really what's been a widespread crackdown on the Muslim Brotherhood? It was very, very mixed, much like Egypt is itself, very divided between those who approve of what the government has done since the ousting of Islamist President Mohamed Morsi of the Brotherhood last year and this massive, massive crackdown. Largely supportive, saying good for the judiciary to act so quickly and get, you know, put people in, in their place. And of course, then from the other side, not just Muslim Brotherhood supporters, but even members of Egypt's judiciary who look at this case and other cases, but particularly this one, how quickly, uh, with any lack of defense uh, representation after just, you know, in the second session to, to come down with these verdicts, really appalled and, and outraged. In Cairo, where support remains strong for the crackdown against supporters of ousted president and brotherhood figure Mohamed Morsi, many were pleased with the decision. This is good because it is the first time we see our judges act so quickly because this was the second session. But such swift action against Morsi supporters, compared to the dragged out cases of pre-revolutionary officials, left others angry. So why hasn't Mubarak been given the death penalty? Why hasn't al Adli been given the death penalty? And generally speaking, how are members of the Muslim Brotherhood being treated right now in Egypt by the government? Well, of course, they, they did label late last year the organization a terrorist organization. So it's very, very difficult. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of Muslim Brotherhood members in jail. A lot of the people have not come to court. So they're just sort of languishing at, the po at this point. Protests are very, very difficult to organize. They still do come out. But it's, it's not in the numbers we saw right after all of this came. And part of it is because they're backed up. Part of it is by, by legal uh, restrictions on, on gatherings. But also just that there is a certain sense of futility of, of just by protest. And, and it's very difficult to, to figure out where this will go next. Yeah, and this has to raise a lot of questions among the international community as well. How, how have other countries responded? Oh, we've seen sort of condemnation across the board. It's not clear what can actually be done. The U.S. Even, the U.S. says it will look at its aid policy in relation to that and that. But in, they did qualify that on whether or not these sentences will be carried out. And it should be noted, it, nobody really does think that they will be, you know, actually at least certainly not all 500 and nearly 30 be carried out. Most were, were tried in absentia. But the absolute legal sketchiness on which it was based probably will not, will not stand on appeal. Right. And so the military government has obviously been focusing a lot on targeting the Muslim Brotherhood. But what are some of the other challenges? I mean, is this really enough for them to hold on to, to power in the way they've been trying to? 
it certainly is a major challenge trying to, to keep all, not just the Muslim Brotherhood, but other opposition at bay. And they're putting so much effort into that. But as we saw when, when CC announced his presidency, he asked for patience. He said he's not a miracle worker. And that actually might be even more of a challenge for him. This some by this summer, in the next couple of months, when it gets hotter and and there's less electricity, there is a huge shortage of, of liquefied natural gra- gas and, and other fuel. Yeah, and when you when you see that, and when you see conditions having worsened, that also has to raise a strong question about whether this democratic transition has been successful. Did it really succeed in the way that it was hoped? And so, I mean, you're living it. So, what would you say? Well, I think if you go back to the original cry of the 2011 revolution, bread, freedom, dignity, and really on all three score counts, there has not been market improvement. I mean, I think suppose it in, in some terms, dignity, people do feel the right that they're able to come out and speak. And that has helped a lot, even though, of course, for a large segment, that's, that's slipped back since then. But the, the basic demands of the revolution have not been met by, by, I think, by anybody's count. And thanks, as always, to Elizabeth Arad in Cairo. Now, in what Human Rights Watch is calling one more nail in the coffin for Egypt's revolution, an appeals court has upheld the sentences of three liberal leaders of the 2011 uprising. All right, it's time for a break. Now, when we come back, the race is heating up for the 2016 U.S. presidential election. You're watching On Assignment. The next U.S. presidential election is still more than two years away, and there appears to be no clear front-runner for the Republican Party's nomination for the 2016 race. Joining me right now is VOA national correspondent Jim Malone. Thank you so much for joining me. You bet. Uh, we have some new faces considering a run for 2016, but who do you think stands out? Well, uh, what do you think about a third Bush term or wow. third Bush presidency? Wow. Uh, one of the names we're talking about is actually an old name, the former Florida governor, Jeb Bush. Uh, a lot of establishment, mainstream Republicans would like him to take a look at the race. He's thinking about it. He'll decide by the end of the year. He's already set off a bit of a hornet's nest of controversy with some comments on immigration, basically more reform-minded than many conservatives would like. But if you take Bush out of the mix, you're going to get a lot of new faces, people like Kentucky Senator Rand Paul, Texas Senator Ted Cruz, some governors like Scott Walker of Wisconsin, John Kasich of of Ohio, plus Chris Christie, the governor of New Jersey. He's had some scandal problems, though, and that's why people, at least on the mainstream side, are looking at Jeb Bush. So does it mean new faces would also bring a new strategy or a new image or a new look for the Republican Party? Each presidential election cycle in our history is really different from the last. Uh, The last two candidates were not wildly enthusiastic people for the conservative base of the Republican Party. Uh, That would be John McCain in 08 and Mitt Romney last time. Uh, The question is, though, do Republicans want to win? And the debate that will take place this year and into 2016, what's the role of the conservative Tea Party movement? Do they get to veto the candidates that run for president? Okay. Before we get to 2016, we have uh, November elections coming up for Congress. What effects do you think that would have on the 2016 presidential race? Well, here's the interesting thing about our midterm elections, which are every two years. Uh, When there's not a presidential election going on, the voting electorate is different. Uh, Only the really committed voters tend to come out in the midterm elections. It's a smaller piece of the pie. Uh, The Obama success was in 08 and 12. He was able to energize a lot of newer voters, younger voters, minority voters, uh, a lot of women to come out. Democrats are worried this year that they won't come out and vote, and that's why Republicans think they have an excellent chance to make gains in Congress. The question is, if Republicans do do well in 2014, what lessons will they learn for 2016? They still have a problem uh, being able to appeal to a broader group of voters, and it's not clear how the results in 2014 will impact that. Okay, and in 45 seconds, if we can, what about the Democrats? Hillary Clinton next? 
Right now, it's uh, Hillary and no one else, providing she decides to run. There is Vice President Joe Biden, who would like to run, but he's seen the poll numbers right now. It's only a question of whether Hillary wants to run, but I do think there'll be some space in the, in the Democratic primaries for some sort of a challenge, especially on the party's left, because Hillary Clinton is not all beloved by liberals, and there'll be an opportunity there for someone they may not believe they can win, but they do want to make the arguments to what they would believe strengthen the Democratic Party. I still think there'll be some sort of a race on the Democratic side. Great. Looking forward to that. Thank you so much for joining us, VOA National Correspondent Jim Malone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, time for another break coming up. The lingering effects of the Holocaust. You're watching On Assignment. During World War II, France's state-run railway known as SNCF transported thousands of Jews to their deaths in Nazi prison camps. Now today that same company is the majority stockholder bidding on a light rail project in the U.S. state of Maryland very close to where we're standing here in Washington. Yep, and some Maryland lawmakers are pushing for SNCF to pay reparations to Holocaust victims and their families before participating in the project. Viewers Carla Babb talked with me about their concerns we should mention at the top of the story that this story contains some disturbing images. My maternal grandparents, my paternal great-grandparents, and I also lost my aunt, my father's sister. The suffering didn't end in the gas chambers and the crematoria of Auschwitz. Maryland resident Ellen Lightman cherishes keepsakes of her family, it lost is. in the Holocaust. It, it was heartbreaking being there in her house with all of the things that she had from her family members, especially when she started going through the letters. Some of the letters from her grandfather uh, talked about how he was getting hungry and talked about when how he wished the family well family. because he had missed you know. a wedding. And having her read that and she would start to choke up, it made me want to choke up as well. It, it was just hard to think about losing somebody in such a horrific way. Leidman's family members were among 76,000 people, mostly Jews, transported by SNCF rail to Nazi death camps. They were paid per head per kilometer to transport people, human beings. They were complicit and they need to be held accountable. So what are the two sides of the story? Well, the two sides of the story are the Holocaust survivors and their family members. And what they want is they want this rail company that's bidding on building this rail line in Maryland to pay reparations and to come out and take responsibility for their actions during the Holocaust. On the flip side, the rail company says it was World War II. It was 1940 Germany, France. German troops had overrun France and we were put under their control. So we weren't complicit, we were forced to do this. 800 were executed because they had disobeyed orders. Another 1,200 were deported and murdered in deportation. So when I hear that we somehow were complicit, I say, were we really complicit with more than 2,100 of our own employees being murdered by the Nazis? It's a tough a very tough situation because you can understand both sides. You can understand the hurt and the loss on one side and you can understand how the company lost people as well. So it's one of those things that a lot of people are turning to the American government and the French government to sort out. Critics would argue that Ellen um, or the Lightman family is just after money and the railroad company or the light rail company is will be helping thousands of people by setting up this uh, light rail service. What, do, what, what does the Lightman family have to say about that? Well, Ellen Lightman and some of the other people who are bringing this up, one of them was Leo Bretholtz, and he passed away um, just a couple weeks ago. And he was very adamant about saying, it's not about money, it's about a symbol of saying, we're sorry, we take responsibility. And the way Ellen Lightman explained it to me, she said, they did not show any interest in talking to us 
until we started using money as a medium. She said money is the only way this company is going to say that they're sorry. It seems pretty complex. It seems like a pretty complex case. Where do you think it's going to end up? Where do you think it's going to go? As an international lawyer that I spoke with said, France has already paid reparations to citizens in four other countries. So right now, the United States and France are trying to talk about how reparations can be received by U.S. citizens that were affected by the Holocaust Lay in off. France. It is actually the French government that needs to get off the dime and provide for the U.S. what it has for four other countries. Officials close to this are saying that they're hoping to, to sort something out by the end of this summer. And that's well ahead of any sort of time frame for this purple line in Maryland because this line, the bidding process, is in 2015. But there are other companies that are bidding for this. So this is strictly just about SNCF's bid. And again, that was VOA's Carla Babb. Now, it's interesting to note, Imran, that this push for groups with Nazi ties to compensate Holocaust victims here in the U.S. is not a new thing at all. It's actually been underway since the 1990s. All right, moving on. A new study at the Cleveland Clinic shows surgery to reduce stomach size reverses type 2 diabetes 90% of the time, with patients getting normal blood sugar levels, sometimes immediately after the procedure. And diabetes can cause a whole host of problems, including blindness and kidney failure. So this really is great news for people suffering from it. VOA health reporter Carol Pearson gave me the full story when we spoke. Eight years ago, Marla Evans had type 2 diabetes. This is what she looked like before surgery. Since then, she's lost 36 kilograms. Evans participated in a study led by Dr. Philip Schauer at the Cleveland Clinic. Dr. Schauer wanted to see if the surgery could help patients with diabetes. This disease over time can be very debilitating, causing blindness, uh, kidney failure, amputations, heart attack, and stroke. A few years ago, Dr. Schauer published the initial results of his study. He found that the stomach shrinking surgery reversed type 2 diabetes. The latest results are the same. In 90% of the cases, it reverses type 2 diabetes. And type 2 is the kind that you get either because you're genetically predisposed or uh, you're overweight or you don't exercise enough. It's a lifestyle sort of thing, but it can also be genetic if you get it related to age or if you have a family history of it. So, Carol, why does this surgery work to cure, reverse diabetes? That's an interesting question. And Dr. Schauer looked at both patients who lost weight the old-fashioned way and patients who had this kind of surgery and lost their weight. There is a different chemical reaction in the body that reverses this kind of diabetes. So it's not the actual fact, then, of losing the weight that reverses it. No, it's the chemical reaction that takes place in the body. The doctors are now looking at this. It's proven that this kind of surgery reverses type 2 diabetes in 90% cases. The other thing that it does is that even if you're not completely off your medicine, you can reduce the amount of medicine that you take. The patients who are on this lose 25-35% of the, their total body weight, and so they have therefore improved their lifestyle. Now who's most affected by diabetes? Usually people who are older, but there are a lot of younger people they're finding now, teenagers who are developing type 2 diabetes. Again, that's through lifestyle. Now your story focused on this woman, Marla, who received this surgery and it reversed her type 2 diabetes. What struck you about her story? Well, how successful it was. I have talked to people who have had bariatric surgery, uh, which is a stomach stapling surgery. It reduces the size of your stomach. You have to be very careful about what you eat. She said she follows her doctor's instructions explicitly. You have to eat your protein first because protein is going to fill up your stomach. Remember, after you have this uh, surgery, the stomach is only the size of a walnut. So it wow. doesn't take much to fill that up. And if people don't follow the prescribed way of eating and, and eat 
you know, pasta, they end up being so full that it, it, it stretches it's that small yeah. space. And uh, they are the ones who are going to most likely have problems with this kind of surgery. But what struck me about it is, although she said, I miss ice cream, hmm. she found that the things she could eat, she liked. What would you say to people, uh, you know, talking about the risks of diabetes, what do people need to know? One of the things that struck me about Marla Evans, the woman in the piece, is that she said she no longer suffered from such fatigue. She now had the energy to play with her granddaughter. I have energy, I have a new life, but I am not a diabetic anymore. VOA's Carol Pearson, who covers medical news for us. And on a personal note, one of our VOA colleagues here actually had this surgery and also got this same great result, the disappearance of type 2 diabetes. So really incredible development here. All right. For our next story, we're going to South Africa, the most advanced nation on the African continent, yet some 3 million residents live without electricity. The viewers Anita Powell visited a remote village that is getting electricity for the first time, and it's coming straight from the sun. Wilson Shitande has lived in the remote village of Kwakwane for as long as he can remember. He boasts that he knows every stick, every rock, and every plant in this settlement of less than 100 people. But one thing the 70-year-old never thought he would see has finally come to this village in South Africa's largely rural Limpopo province. Electricity. In the local Venda language, the name Guakwane literally means armpit. It's so named because it's wedged under the nearest river and other important landmarks. But perhaps residents say the village's modesty has also led to their being overlooked in their request for electricity. We have been expecting that there would be electricity, but since we are poor, we have nothing. So we have just been hoping that someday something would happen. Despite the villagers' appeals to the municipality, the power lines stop at the next village over. Local ward councillor Robin Lani Garabeni says the power utility and municipality don't have the budget to bring the lines to Guakwane. Instead, electricity is coming through a private initiative led by the University of Johannesburg. We see that that thing, it will take time so that we, we even happen to engage with uh, the University of Johannesburg so that if maybe they can do uh, solar uh, uh, project, it will help our people faster than when we, we have to, to, to budget for the main line. A team from the university's electrical engineering department recently traveled 800 kilometers to the village to install solar panels donated by a local business. The small amount of power generated by the solar panels will initially fuel a water pump that until now has run on diesel fuel. Jove says that is just the start of the project. The next phase will include more improvements. Godfrey Nafulapudwe has operated this aging pump for four years. He travels once a month to the nearest town to buy the diesel fuel. He says he's grateful for the small amount of electricity, but that he and his neighbors would like more. It's going to help us a lot, and we need you to come back and electrify on our houses, yeah, because it make, when we, without electricity, we live hard. Yeah, because we must move from that village to another village to charge even your phone or laptops. Guakwane has always been a sleepy little village. But now that electricity is finally coming, maybe its residents, young and old, will get a better connection to the modern world. Anita Powell, VOA News, Guakwane, South Africa. And fortunately, Alex, as you can see, we still have lights on in the studio. It's a blessing. Yes, it really is. We are very fortunate in this country to have yeah. such reliable electricity. But you know what? These lights are actually not going to be on mm -hmm. much longer because we are about to say goodbye, but we will be back again next week with a whole new program for you. But you can watch On Assignment anytime at VOAnews.com, and the website is also a great place to get up-to-the-minute news on every major world news story. Yeah, now from all of us here at On Assignment, thank you so much for watching, and join us next time.